exchange between Jesus and the man with many possessions is one of those stories that can be found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. Sundays uh, at 2 p.m. here at the church, we're studying the Synoptics. Uh, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke to find out how they relate to each other and why they tell many of the same stories in nearly the exact same words, even down to word choice, order, and grammatical construction. This story is one of those that comes to us originally from Mark's gospel, where we've read it today, and is found repeated in Matthew and in Luke with some slight variations, but mostly the same. It's a story about Jesus on a trip, and a man comes up to him and falls down at his feet and says, please, please, teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus questions him, quizzes him. What, why do you ask me this question? What, is the, what does the law say? What are, what are the commandments? And then he runs through the commandments, especially those that have to deal with each other. I mean, the commandment with regards to loving the Lord your God, the, com the commandment with having no other gods before me, the commandment about not having any idols, those, those, uh, the, the commandment to keep the Sabbath day, those are sort of already given. Those are expected, those are presumed to be true and to presumed to be kept. The ones that he focuses on are those commandments that deal with how we relate to other people. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He goes through this list. What about these? Have you kept those? And the man says, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Wow. I've kept all these since my youth. I always thought when I was young, and especially early on in my ministry, I thought this man was bragging. I've kept all these since I was young, he said. I've kept all of these commandments. I haven't done any of these things since I was young. Look how good I am. And, and it's striking, really, if you think about it, to have kept the commandments without fail since one's youth. He's rich, and yet he hasn't stolen, lied, or defrauded another person. That's impressive. <laughs> He's recognized Jesus as an authority to tell him how to obtain eternal life, which means he has a spiritual discernment sufficient to know the truth. Think about it. He's come up to Jesus. He's probably heard Jesus preach and teach. So he knows Jesus is a good person to ask this question to. He knows that, this, that Jesus, this, this rabbi from Nazareth, is to be trusted to tell him the truth. He has the spiritual discernment to ask the question. What must I do to have eternal life? He affirms that he's been proficient in keeping the whole law. Something that might seem boastful. It, it did to me. But also, you know, could be true, approximately so, and by their rules and regulations and the way they interpret them, perhaps. But he wants to know what more he must do than that. And that's interesting. Keeping the law, doing the right thing, living in accordance with God's will. This should be enough, right? You'd think that with good discernment, he would know that this is all sufficient, that this is enough. But this man doesn't discern that. He keeps thinking, he seems to think, he seems to believe that there's something more he's got to do. He needs to be doing something else in addition to keeping the commandments. Something more, something different must be required. That's at least his own spiritual discernment of his own situation, his own condition. He knows that something is lacking in him. He knows that something is lacking in his spiritual walk, in his spiritual life. Something is lacking in his relationship with God. Something is lacking with his relationship with other people. Something is lacking, even though he's kept the commandments. He's not doing something that he needs to be doing to have eternal life. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. And I think, by the way, that's interesting. You lack one thing. And he tells him a couple of things, but you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Mm. We have a peek here into the truth about the man that he had kept probably even from himself. He loved his wealth more than the truth. He loved his attainments, keeping the law, more than the truth. He loved who he was and what he had, what was his and what he had done, all those things that he was doing to keep the commandments, all the things that he had, his possessions. He loved them more than accepting that following Jesus, that eternal life could possibly be an all or nothing proposition. God wants all of us. I don't mean that just as all of us here as people. I mean, God wants all of me and all of you. Not 10%, like a tithe. Not 20%, like the second tithe. Not 30%, like the third tithe. Not 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90% of you. God wants all of you. Every bit of who and what we are dedicated to following Jesus. But this man, this, as one translation and one version calls it, the rich young ruler, this young man, this wealthy man with many possessions, wasn't willing to do that. And, quite frankly, Neither are most of us. This guy has already done better than most of us. He's kept the Mosaic Covenant. I couldn't have told Jesus that I had kept the commandments since my youth. If I tried to say that, I would be breaking one of those commandments, the commandment about bearing false witness. I'd be lying. If I were to say I had kept all the commandments since my youth, So he's doing a whole lot better than me going out the gate. Some interpreters have said that this is the man's problem. He only thought that he had sufficiently kept the law. I like that approach. I like that approach here, but but I'm not sure it fits. Jesus doesn't say that. Uh, He doesn't say that, well, you've kept it enough. You've kept it some, but you didn't keep it all really. You kept it to the best of your knowledge, but, but not completely parsing words here in the good rabbinical tradition. I mean, let's do the Sabbath day one for just a second here. Is it a sin to eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath day? Because the Sabbath day rule said that you can't even um, do, uh, you can't work nor can your animals or your servants work on the Sabbath day. Well, is laying that egg a, a work? Well, you know, if you're the chicken laying the egg, I, I would assume, yeah, it, it is. So you should not eat that egg that was laid on the Sabbath day. One rabbinical argument went. Another one said that if you broke an arm or a leg, you could bind the break, but you couldn't set it until after the sun set at the end of the Sabbath day. Ooh. It might already start knitting by then, Ooh, depending on when you broke it. Ooh. So yeah, we can parse the rules, we can parse the commandments and interpret them carefully. That's not what's talking about here. Jesus isn't challenging that approach. And, and we'll come to the extended commentary in a moment. I want to finish this first. 
It says that Jesus looked at him and he loved him after his response. Yes, I kept the commandments. It says he loved him. Jesus' compassion for this guy is total and it's real. He's not playing with him. He's not being sarcastic with him. He's being very serious here. He's taking this man at face value and he's believing this man's word that I've kept these commandments. He takes him what he says literally. You lack one thing, though. You lack one thing. Sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Giving up all the other things he depended upon was the first step. Giving the proceeds of that sale to those who have nothing is the second step. Following Jesus is the third. And it says that the man was shocked and went away grieving. The contrast between how the man comes to Jesus with excitement and expectation to hear what he's going to have to do next to have eternal life and then how he leaves at the end of the encounter is startling. He comes excited to ask the question, good and wise teacher, and he leaves grieving because he had many possessions. He comes inquiring with excitement and eager expectation, just another task or two to perform, just another law to keep, just something, one more thing, just one more thing to do, and I'll have made it. He's still into acquiring things. He's still into acquiring things and doing things. I'm reminded of how frustrated I was as a kid that every year I missed out on getting the, on earning the Sunday school perfect attendance pin at Walnut Hill Methodist Church. You know, they used to give these little pins. And I really wanted one. I mean, I, I really wanted one. I even schemed to find a way to get one when I knew I hadn't earned one. Why did I earn one? Because guess what? I missed Sundays. I missed Sundays because we would travel. And that shouldn't count. Mom and Dad took me away. And I missed Sundays because I was sick. And that shouldn't count because I was sick, right? But in reality, most of the Sundays I missed, I missed because uh, I stayed up too late Saturday night and didn't want to get up on Sunday morning. Little secret. Right? Well, that's kind of true today <laughs> at times. Oh, that perfect attendance pin. I wanted it so badly, but I couldn't earn it. Why? Because I wasn't doing what was necessary to get it. I was into acquiring stuff and I missed too many classes and I knew it. I wanted that recognition, but I knew I couldn't do it. And the man knew deep down inside that he lacked something. He had so much stuff. And he had done so much in keeping the law. But he knew, his spiritual discernment was sufficient, that he knew it wasn't enough. And then he discovered that it wasn't about what he possessed. His perfect performance of the law, his spiritual discernment, getting that pin for perfect attendance at the synagogue. No. It wasn't any of that. It wasn't about himself and his doing something and his accomplishments. It had nothing to do with any of that. You know, I've, I've got that problem too. I have that problem too. When I was a kid, I wanted to be shown how to tie my shoelaces. Then I wanted to do it myself. And every time I would start to tie them, I would mess up. 
I would tie them wrongly, they'd come undone. Or worse yet, I'd tie them together between the two sets of shoes and they would get so tied up in knots that there was no way to undo them and dad would have to take a knife and cut them. But every time they would come to try to help me to tie my shoelaces, I'd weigh them off and say, no, Greg do, Greg do, Greg do. Mom used to say that one of my favorite phrases was, Greg do. I wanted to do it. I wanted to accomplish this. And I would get angry if I couldn't do it. I'd get angry not at anybody else. I'd get angry at me for not being able to do it. And I would get disappointed in myself because I wasn't able to do it. This man is the same way. But when he was confronted with the truth that it's not about what he has or what he has done, but about simply giving it all up and following Jesus, it was too much for him. Let's look at the extended interpretation here that we have been provided thanks to Jesus' <laughs> kindness in explaining this teaching. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And right there, I'm starting to get nervous. You know. Well, we can start to parse these words very carefully. Wealth, okay. Great wealth? What's, what's wealth? I mean, I look at my bank account at the end of the month and I realize you know, there's not much left. I mean, I can't be wealthy, right? Hmm. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, I mean, he obviously realized they didn't get it, so I'm going to say it again. Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astounded and said to each other, uh, th then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Now, a lot of interpretation has gone into trying to understand this passage across centuries. Some have tried to claim that there was a gate in the Jerusalem walls called the Eye of the Needle Gate. And that for a caravan of camels to get through that gate... They would come up to it. It was so small that for that caravan of camels to get through it, they would have to lift the packs of cargo off those camels' back and lift off the saddles so it's just the camel. And then with just the camel, if the camel, that they're careful and they get behind and they push on the camel's rear end, they might be able to, if the camel is willing to actually get down a little bit, might be able to squeeze the camel through into Jerusalem through the gate. That's one of my favorite attempts at interpreting the passage, if only because it's also made up of hooey. It's not true. There was no eye of the needle gate in the walls of Jerusalem. Nice try, but no. Another approach is to say that the reference is to a coarse thread. A coarse thread, a thread made out of camel's hair, a specific kind of thread made out of camel's hair, and that normally it was just too thick to get it through the eye of a needle for sewing, but, but with lots of careful work by laking it and by taking a knife and shaving off the end to kind of get it a little thinner so that it might actually fit into that eye of that needle with a lot of careful work, you might actually be able to slip, slip it in and then pull it through the rest of the way onto the needle. But in reality, it was so hard that only really God could do it. All right? Nope. <laughs> I like that one too, but nope. That's not the meaning here. It doesn't really take the passage in its entirety seriously. This is one of those rare phrasings that truly really does suggest a literal interpretation. Well, that makes a lot of us uncomfortable. You want to read the Bible literally? Uh-huh. That's how both Matthew and Luke interpret it when they're reading it out of Mark. 
And guess what? It's also how the disciples are interpreting it. When they're hearing Jesus say it, well, then who can be saved? I mean, camel, needle. Camel, I've ridden a camel. I went on a cruise that stopped in Casablanca, and I took the day tour over to Marrakesh, and part of that tour involved getting off the bus, being um, hawked at by a whole bunch of salespeople, and then paying money and getting up into the saddle of a camel and having my picture taken up there. You know, they just love to do that kind of thing. Camels are big friends. I've ridden horses a bunch of times, and they're big too. A camel is a lot bigger, a lot wider, and there's no way that a great big camel is going to make it in the tiny, itty, bitty little eye of a needle. No amount of pushing, no amount of shaving, it's going to do it. For mortals, it's impossible. But for God, all things are possible. Oh. Huh. Be easier to get this huge camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Mm. No matter how hard things get for us financially, no matter how small our bank accounts become, if we have roof over our heads, clothing on our backs, a car to drive, we know where our next, next meal, in fact, our next 12 meals are coming from, we have internet, 401ks, social security, yeah. we're rich by their standards. And that's even how the disciples looked at it. They were greatly astounded and said to each other, then who can be saved? That's amazing, really, because the disciples know they're not rich. But if the camel and the needle reference was true for rich people, well, gosh, it's going to be really hard then, even for poor people like us, to get in. If it's that impossible, for someone who is rich. Who could be saved? Who can be delivered? Who can be made whole? Jesus had been about healing people throughout his ministry. People who didn't deserve it, people who hadn't earned it, people who couldn't make it themselves. It was always freely given to them. Now, they might have to respond with faith and get up and take their mat and walk. They might have to have a response, but it was freely given. They didn't have to pay for it. Jesus gave them healing, just like Jesus gave them forgiveness. Jesus gave them food to eat. Jesus was about giving, constantly giving. Had the disciples remembered that and realized that in this moment, they would understand that it isn't about us getting through that needle. It's about God. It's about God. And following Jesus. Remember, that young man's problem wasn't that so much that he was rich. It wasn't that he hadn't kept the rules and the regulations. That wasn't it at all. He had. He kept the law. He was rich. But those weren't the issues. The issue was that when he was confronted with the reality, when he was confronted with what he had to do, with the one thing he needed to do, sell his stuff, give the money to the poor, and follow Jesus, when he was confronted with that last thing, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. He went away grieving. He wasn't willing to do it, to stop trusting in himself and his stuff and his abilities, and simply follow Jesus. And frankly, that is what plagues most of us today. Remember what I said earlier? Jesus wants all of us. 
Yes, all of us, but also all of each and every one of us. That means being dedicated completely and totally to God. And that is how we follow Jesus. By living the life he calls us to live. By being the people he calls us to be. By loving and serving and giving. Dedicated to him. Dedicating to loving God and loving neighbor as self. That man did a lot. Kept the law. Had a lot of stuff. And was depending upon his ability to do both. To live. And maybe some extra work that Jesus would give him to do. Some extra hoop he'd have to jump through. But no. No hoops. Set all that aside, Jesus said. Give it all away. And follow me. And he couldn't do it. The last bit of the passage is fascinating to me. Peter, he hears what is being said here. He, he joins with the disciples in asking who can be saved. And Jesus, he hears what Jesus says, that it, with, with mortals it is impossible. With God all things are possible. And, and then he remembers back to what Jesus told the young man, that give up all your stuff and follow me. Shazam, he realizes, we've done that. So he turns to Jesus and he says, uh, look, we've left everything and followed you. Peter's always good at taking his left foot and extending it into his mouth up to his ankle. He's really good at that, friends. And in that way, he's a lot like me. Jesus says, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. And you know, that sounds really good. And you know, wow, so we're going to get it all back. Houses, brothers, can we... Maybe avoid a brother or two. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields. And Jesus says to throw this one in. And with persecutions. Ew. Yuck. And in the age to come, eternal life. Well, you finally got to that. Whew. Okay. But many who are first will be last. And the last will be first. Got to hand it to Peter. He thought, oh, we're doing it. We're doing what that man who just walked away grieving, we're, we've done it. I left my business as a fisher person, and I'm following Jesus. Matthew left his job as a tax collector, and he's following Jesus. Yeah, we've done it. <laughs> yes, you have, Jesus says. And you're going to get it all back with persecutions in this life, and in the next life, eternal life. In the next, in eternity, you'll have eternal life. Whew. But, he then adds, the first will be last, and the last will be first. You know, that man who walked away from Jesus, we don't know what happened to him. He may have ended up selling all of his stuff and following Jesus. He might have become one of, the, one of the great early apostles of the church. We don't know. Likewise with us. Are we willing to set aside our own attainments, our own abilities, our own keeping of the law, the rules and the regulations that we live under and following Jesus? We get caught up in the stuff of religion instead of the spirituality and reality of what it means to follow Jesus. Are we willing to set all that aside? Make it of no importance to ourselves? And instead of trusting in our own ability to, to do and to achieve and to build and to grow, are we going to be willing to simply trust Jesus and follow Jesus. Hmm. Lots of Christians today, especially those in the evangelical world, think it's very important as to what you do and what you don't do 
And especially what you believe. They have this long list of things that you've got to believe in order to be saved. And you have this list of things that you're supposed to do and a great big list of things you're not supposed to do. And if you do these things and you believe these things, then you'll be saved. Is that anywhere in the story? No. Likewise, for Methodists, there is no book of discipline and rules and regulations there. So we're not just going to pick on the evangelicals, got to pick on me too. When, when another pastor in the North Texas Conference has a problem, either gets into trouble or whatever, and, and it's an issue with the discipline, or if he's trying to do something and wants to make sure it's kosher with the discipline, guess who he calls? Half the time they call me. Why? Because I supposedly know the discipline. Yeah. Ugh. Why do we trust in this stuff? Why do we trust in our attainments, in our stuff, and not in Jesus? In trusting God and following Jesus. That's that man's problem. He wasn't willing to do that. He wasn't willing to let go of his attainment of the law. He wasn't willing to let go of his stuff and follow Jesus. Will we? Will we let go and follow Christ? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Your